Hi, David McKinster here. This is just an addendum to the lecture, What is Truth? Uh, the reason I decided to do an addendum was that I was teaching a face-to-face -face, uh, incarnation of this course uh, last semester, and there was such a good discussion between myself and the students at that time that I thought, you know, there are a few points that we've gone over that I don't really go over in the online course. <clears throat> and the online course would be better if I added this additional material. So this is just a supplement, okay, to the, the things we discuss when we uh, talk about what is truth and things that I talk about in that video lecture. I'm going to begin with something called Jordan's Paradox. You probably have encountered some version of this in a non-philosophical context. You don't have to see what's written on here. I'm just going to tell you. This side of the paper, it says the sentence on the reverse side is true. And on this side, the reverse side, it says the sentence on the reverse side is false. Okay, um, that's a paradox because if it's true that what's on the reverse side is, uh, is true, okay, well this says it's false. So if it's false, it's true, but if it's true, it's false. Um, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Yet these are two grammatically well-formed sentences with familiar vocabulary. They seem like the kind of sentences that ought to be meaningful and we ought to be able to say this is true or this is false. Jordan's paradox is meant to show that you can have grammatically well-formed sentences that can be neither true nor false. Okay. If I were to say to you, there's this, this is another <coughs> incarnation, Doug Hofstetter, the fellow who writes books on artificial intelligence, is very fond of this one. This sentence is false. What does that even mean? Various people have various interpretations. I tend to favor the interpretation that it, in fact, doesn't mean anything. It's incapable of describing either any coherent use of rules regarding language and logic or any state of affairs in the world. Therefore, it really it gives the illusion of being a meaningful sentence without being one. Okay, Jourdain was interested, though, in the implications of this. Language about language can end up being neither true nor false. Well, gee, is that's a problem maybe for the coherence theory of language, right? <laughs> or co coherence theory of truth, rather. The correspondence theory says that eventually we have to be pointing to something in the world. And either what we're pointing to exists, as we've described it, or it doesn't. So ultimately, our, you know, our, assertive, our assertions are true or false. That's, as, I, as I mentioned in the What is Truth lecture, that's why Russell uh, makes the distinction between knowledge by acquaintance and knowledge by description. Description has to drill down to acquaintance. At some point, we actually have to have contact with the world. Language can't just be free-floating. Now, this is sometimes characterized as the difference between a closed system and an open system. A closed system is one that does not really reference anything outside of itself. Games are sometimes that way. A uh, Open system is one that does reference things outside of itself. It receives input from outside of itself. Uh, your bank account is an open system, okay? Because you can make deposits, you can make withdrawals, interest can be posted, etc., etc., etc. It's not just simply self-contained. On the other hand, if you're playing solitaire, that's more or less a closed system. It's self-referential. You know, someone else doesn't have to do anything to have input into that game in order for you to play that game. Okay, now that has some interesting, some interesting implications. If you get back to the whole controversy about universals, what, are ex univer what do universals in language actually point to? Well, of course, a realist says, such as Plato or Bertrand Russell says, universals exist independently of the knower. Okay, things such as roundness, redness, mathematical truths, logical truths, and so forth, those General abstract truths exist outside of the mind of the knower. In other words, we discover them. We don't, we don't invent them, we discover them. Okay? We ask questions like, okay, if, if Plato uses the example in the Republic of someone is doing uh, geometry, how does he arrive at the notion of a definition of, uh, say, circularity? Well, he takes different particular circles and he says, what do they have in common, by virtue of which we class them together under this term circle? Okay, but you know, we've been through that when we talked about the sun, line, and cave, but um, for someone embracing the correspondence theory, truth is about the world. 
the very fact that a sentence arises in a closed system where you are no longer even talking about the world, that, that puts you into, uh, you know, into description without acquaintance. Okay? That puts you into self-referential language that does not have a point of semantic contact with the world. And that, someone such as Russell, someone such as Plato would say, that is the source of the problem. You're no longer even trying to use language, to use thought, to reference the world. It's sort of turned back on itself. A conceptualist, this is another alternative for interpreting uh, uh, general abstract propositions. <laughs> a conceptualist would say that universals are in fact artifacts of our own mind. Okay? They are truths about how we think about the world. Okay? But no minds, no universals. Okay? In other words, we don't so much discover them as invent them. Now, of course, in this controversy between realism and conceptualism, the realists would fire back, why would we invent one set of concepts to deal with the world rather than another if, in fact, one didn't better describe our actual experience of the world, our actual acquaintance with the world, the way the world actually does seem to behave? Okay? If you are a conceptualist, you might be uh, partial to the coherence theory of truth. Because as long as the set of concepts, if, the, if universal is just artifacts of our own minds, all we have to do is make sure that we're being consistent in our usage, or sufficiently consistent that we don't, that we don't run into problems. But um, that kind of begs the question, what would a problem even be if I don't really have to describe the world? Or if I am describing the world, haven't I in fact defaulted back to some kind of correspondence? Okay, finally, nominalism. Nominalism is the position that universals are in fact artifacts of language. Universals are a feature of language, but like any other feature of language, they are somewhat arbitrary. Things could be handled differently in any given language. Um, <clears throat> There are rules for using language, and that's really what universals are about. When I say one plus one equals two, what I'm doing is setting down rules for how to use symbols. Okay? Well, if those are only rules about how to use symbols, why are they not simply arbitrary? Why is it that mathematics can actually be used to understand and predict and manipulate the natural world? Okay? Uh, it would seem that, if it, that you're almost falling into a kind of solipsism with this that says as long as, as, long as it's linguistically consistent, I can bloody well do anything I want. <laughs> well, this was a big, this realism versus conceptualism versus nominalism was a big source of debate during uh, the medieval period of philosophy. Okay? Uh, I will just be a bad boy once again and say that... Uh, Remember how the, the medievals you used to think that they could do physics just by purely speculating and saying to be rationally satisfying, this is the way the world must be. And virtually everything they said about the operations of the planets, uh, the physical universe, whatever, virtually everything they said was wrong. And if anybody ever bothered to check up on it, they would see that, that these descriptions were wrong. And indeed, that with the rise of modern science, people did start checking up and saying, whoa, restart. <laughs> okay. Are we, perhaps, at some point, doing exactly the same thing, say, with, with nominalism, doing exactly the same thing, but, in fact, doing a kind of an a priori linguistics, treating linguistics as if it can be done purely by conjecture, by logical argument, without actually exploring, uh, in a scientific manner, the, uh, the way in which language arises, the way in which language is used, um, are we not, in fact, falling into areas which are no longer properly addressed by philosophy? Now, I have said that before. I, I, the first time I, I articulated that, that question was to a, um, a friend of mine who had a PhD in linguistics from Yale, and I thought the guy was going to kiss me. He said, yes, exactly, that is exactly true. Uh, repeating it to an analytical philosopher could, you know, could, you know get you into a, a heated, let's say, um, tiff. There we go, that's a polite word. A heated tiff, because essentially what you're saying is uh, emperor's got no clothes. There are some, th uh, there are some questions 
which philosophy can properly deal with because they are philosophical questions. But when you start speculating too much about the mechanics of, of language, are you in fact not doing what the medievals did with physics, but just doing it with linguistics? Are these in fact no longer philosophical questions? And if nominalism is telling us about uh, the rules that govern the use of language, why is that coming from a philosopher, not a, not a linguist, who has done observation, who has done measurement, who has done comparative studies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's in fact that even what we're concerned about, you know, if I'm concerned about, you know, whether this particular vaccine will stop in its tracks this particular virus, I'm not arguing about language, I'm arguing about events in the physical world. And those events don't care what I happen to think about them, they are what they are, okay? So, I realize I'm opening more questions than I'm closing here, but that's exactly my intent. Okay, here's a, here's a consideration that is important. Most contemporary philosophers would talk about the difference between conventional objects and properties and natural kinds. A natural kind is an object or a property that exists in its own right irrespective of whether we know about it, irrespective of how we choose to describe it or what we believe about it, that's just how it is. A conventional object is, or a conventional property exists only because of the way we've chosen to describe the world or because of things we've chosen to do. Good example of that, home run. A home run is not a natural kind. That doesn't mean it isn't real, but it's real only within a set of conventions. If we didn't have the game of baseball, there would be no such thing as a home run. It's not that it isn't real in some sense, it just isn't real in the same sense that, say, gravity is real. If you changed the rules of baseball so that there were no home runs, could you, in fact, uh, could still have the game of baseball? Yeah, because these rules aren't necessary. All rules are, in a sense, arbitrary, uh, unless they reference the world. And within a closed system, such as, uh, such as the rules for a game, they are somewhat arbitrary. Um, as a matter of fact, I'd like to point out at the, uh, in the early part of the 20th century when the rules for baseball were first being made uniform nationally, uh, out of the park was out. If you hit the ball out of, over, the, over the fence, out of the park, you are out. <laughs> Something you didn't want to do. But the fans loved those big power hits. And so the rules were eventually changed, saying, okay, we're going to make it a desirable thing to actually do those power hits and knock the ball over the fence. Well, does that mean that we no longer had the game of baseball? Well, it was, it was different in one respect, because no particular part of that game was crucial to the game existing. This is not about natural kinds. This is not about, about na the forces of nature. This is not about uh, metaphysical concepts without which we could not think about the world. Okay, this is about something we chose to do and we could choose to do it differently. I like to point out, and this sometimes really puzzles students, but it's a good example, species is a conventional idea. Species is not something that you find in nature. What? No, seriously. It is it's a set of decisions we made about how to catalog what we find in nature, how to describe what we find in nature. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you had this experience, but I did, and I, people much younger than myself com have confirmed that they also had this experience. Your history books in elementary school say, well, in, in the olden days, back when people were superstitious, stupid, and ignorant, right? In the olden days, <laughs> uh, people were so silly, they thought that whales were fish. But now we know that whales are actually mammals. Okay, time out. <laughs> no, we made a decision to classify whales with other animals rather than with fish. Now, to, if, you're a, if you're a fisherman in the ancient world, if you're a sailor in the ancient world, um, whales do have quite a bit in common with sharks, with sailfish, with various other kinds of large fish that you see in the sea. Um, so that was one way you could choose to, to classify whales. They, they are a kind of fish, okay? They're like fish in these respects. They're not like fish in those respects. Now, it is not a matter of stunning insight to suddenly say, you know what, we're gonna classify whales with goats and rabbits. 
instead of with, say, sharks and sailfish. It's a decision because we have different concerns. There was a movement in the 1990s called ontogenetic uh, neomorphology, which, you know, it's a mouthful, but basically saying, you know, as much as we know about genes now, we should just dispel, dispense altogether with the, with the idea of species because it's not useful anymore. We should go back and start reclassify things, but people don't like usually to go back to square one and have to do everything over again and learn new vocabulary, so that didn't get very far. <clears throat> But you get, the, you get the picture, this is, a, this is a conventional classification. But what is that classification based on? It's based upon the characteristics of whales, based upon the characteristics of goats, based on the characteristics of this, that, or the other thing that we actually do find in nature. We don't just arbitrarily make up, okay, I'm gonna create this category, blah, blah. What shall I put in that category? Anything I please because it's all arbitrary anyway. So, ducks, tables, laptop computers, toasters, and French wines bottled before 1932. I'm all going to put into this blah blah category. Why? Well, all categories are just, all conventions are just arbitrary. Well, wait, yeah, but why would you even put those things together? Well, if you have no purpose in doing it, then in that sense it's very arbitrary. In that sense it's senseless. Okay, the point is even with conventional, even with conventional objects and conventional properties, we sometimes have very good reasons for preferring one set of concepts over another, and those usually have to do with what we actually find in the world. Okay, not with some baseless preference. Okay, one of the problems with closed systems, and this is a good segue into the final lecture, what now, um, Closed systems can amount essentially to an ideology. I have decided in advance how I'm going to interpret what I see, regardless of what I see. The interpretation doesn't arise from the facts because as far as I'm concerned, everything is ideological anyway. The conceptual framework comes first and that prejudices how I see, how I experience the world. Okay, the dark side of that leads us to things such as scapegoating, superstition, pseudoscience, and conspiracy theories. Okay. I'm not saying there are no conspiracies in the world. I'm saying that, uh, however, I am very, I have not to this day seen any credible evidence that we have been infiltrated by reptilian interdimensional space shifters, and yet there are thousands of people who believe that. Why do they believe that? Hey, it's on YouTube. It's got to be real. Um, okay, and of course I'm being a little frivolous there, but what I'm, what I'm saying is that Essentially, when we make language just about language, we make thought just about thought, we make concepts just about concepts, and we don't go back to trying to semantically fit that to the world, we run the danger of a kind of a collective solipsism. Authoritarian political ideologies are very often this way. Um, Stalin considered himself a philosopher, among other things. And if his scientists didn't get the results that he anticipated, he would have them arrested and, uh, and executed because it must be a plot. I know how the world lives. I know how the world works, rather. And uh, my knowledge of how the world works is based upon my interpretation of the writings of Karl Marx. But we've heard that before, right? You know, Okay, my interpretation of how the world works is based upon my interpretation of this or that scripture. So anyone who says the world works differently is obviously doing evil. We should get rid of that. Okay, um, <clears throat> closed systems are a very dangerous thing. Uh, and this is one reason why Russell being so very pro-science, so very pro-humanity, so dedicated to relieving uh, humanity of the suffering of war and poverty and, and, and you know, all the, all the plagues that are attendant to our uh, managing our affairs badly. Why he wants to be sure that whatever it is we believe, ultimately, it connects back to the world. And it actually helps us then to live in the world as it is, not as we would like to fantasize it to be. Okay, now it's on to what next? <laughs>